Are you ready to head for the finish line? Because that's where we're at. Perfect. So before we do that, I want to share with you um, the Preakness, which is the third in the Triple Crown of horse racing for the United States. Okay, I love horse racing because I love to watch horse, horses run. And I've, hoped, I've had people tell me, you know what, you can't force a horse to be a racehorse. They either love to run or they don't. So it's not like you're cruel to them. It's either in their blood or it's not, and you're just harnessing it. Uh, and so I really, I love watching horses run because it's, for me, like poetry in motion, just watching them. Uh, so I'm going to share this with you, and then afterwards, I think we'll see why. Yeah, we should have bet, huh, before? <laughs> Turn on the lights, please, for up here. It's, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Talk about a nice adrenaline bolt, you know, jolt after lunch. So I want to encourage you, be like cloud computing, okay, as we finish off this workshop. I know the energy is going to dip. But man, we're going for the home stretch, so please come from behind, right? And end up ahead. I mean, I just, I love it, you know, because we can sometimes feel even this way in our culture, you know, like <laughs> we're just in the dust and there's no hope. But with God, there's always hope, right? So I love that. I just love this race. It was a total upset. It's like, yeah, right? Go, go. So, all right. Hurrah for cloud computing, uh, who came from behind and is going to inspire us uh, to dig down deep and find you know everything we need in order to head for the finish line. So we left off on page 5.4, so we're in panel 5. Uh, and uh, we left off by reading about this phrase at the bottom of 5.3, in this way the language of the body becomes the language of the liturgy. Um, so as I said, I really pondered this for a really long time, um, and I realized I don't have this quote in here, but I wanted to also read it to you. It's the very last, it's the very last line um, of the very last audience in panel five. So after this line, then John Paul II begins his reflections on Humanae Vitae. This is the last line. On this road, conjugal life in some sense becomes liturgy. You might want to write that at the top of this page, 5.4. It's audience 117B, number 6. On this road, in other words, this road of conjugal life, on this road, conjugal life in some sense becomes liturgy. Okay, that, that's a pretty unusual phrase. Conjugal life becomes liturgy. Would you ever think to tell a married couple that? You know, your conjugal life is really liturgical. Your intimate life is connected to the liturgy. Um, so, for really many years, I, I really struggled with this, that sentence. On this road, in some way, conjugal life becomes liturgy. Until I began understanding, again, the liturgy in these two... Uh, in these two movements, right? The liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist, which we can also call the liturgy of the body. So I want to look at the connection between the marital embrace and the liturgy. How is it that conjugal life, conjugal union, in some sense, becomes liturgy or liturgical? I want to say very clearly we are entering dangerous territory because the margin for error is very, very slim. And the margin for people misunderstanding us, or the possibility of people misunderstanding us, is very wide. So we have to be very, very careful how we speak about this. So that's the first caution, dangerous territory. I want to be very clear, we are not sexualizing God when we're making a connection between the conjugal embrace and the liturgy, or if we make a connection between the inner life of the Trinity and the one flesh union. We are not sexualizing God. That's very important. God, there is no sexual distinction. 
God is pure spirit, although in Christ we have, this is unbelievable, right? A male body, human body, in the inner life of the Trinity. This is the importance of the ascension. If there's a perfected human body in the inner life of the Trinity. Okay, that's unbelievable. All right, so we're not sexualizing God. Instead, we're reflecting on how a human ra- reality, and what might that P word be? Participates. Remember that quote on divinization. What is uh, penetration and permeation of what is essentially human by what is essentially divine. Penetration and permeation. This idea of participation. This is really, really significant. Uh, as we, when we celebrate Mass, I follow along in the Magnificat, which is um, it's this little booklet here. It's very popular in the United States. But mine happens to be in Spanish, because it's the way I try at least a little bit to keep up my Spanish. So it's been fascinating to me to listen to what's said in English and to read the way the same prayer is languaged in Spanish. And almost always when we use the word share in English, in Spanish it uses the word participate. That might not seem significant, but let's think about this for a moment. Uh, Let's say I want to share some of this water with Dominic. So I take it and I pour it into this glass and I give it to him. Don't drink it. (laughs) I've shared that with him. What if I want Dominic to participate in this glass of water? Is that different? It's very different, isn't it? Right? Here's Dominic participating in this glass of water. You see, so in English we hear share, share, and we think we divide it and we give some. Really, the reality, this is where language makes a difference. The re, uh, what's really happening is we're participating in the reality itself. This is what we're talking about. Is that we're talking about a human reality, not like, okay, I'm going to share a part of God and put it on a human reality. But that a human reality participates in the divine reality. This is where Plato is so unbelievable what he understood already 2,500 years ago where we had the forms and what we can't see, what's invisible, the forms, what we can see visibly is participating in the invisible. He had a kind of natural sacramental understanding of the world that they participated in. And so that's why this is so important. We're reflecting on how a human reality participates in the divine reality of what kind of self-giving? Total self-giving, and now a new word that I'm going to introduce, total self-offering. I think that word is a helpful bridge word to understanding how the conjugal embrace is connected to the liturgy. The language of the liturgy is a language of total surrender. That's what happens. Jesus saying to the Father and to us, this is my body given up for you. He doesn't say this is just part of me. He doesn't say, I'll hold something back. It's total surrender. And it is offering everything to God. And at the same time, it's opening oneself totally to the mystery of life. God's divine life and love. And especially in the liturgy. Because how does God communicate life to us? Through union. He communicates life to us. Through union. It's why you don't receive the Eucharist and throw it like a Frisbee. You receive the Eucharist and it's united with your body. So we offer everything to God in the, um, in the liturgy as, and unite it. We, offer, we open ourselves totally to the mystery of life and to God as the source of all that is. Romans 12.1, I think, is probably the most helpful scripture verse to help connect this conjugal life being liturgy. 12.1, I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I hope if you are experiencing the call to priesthood, when you read this, it should make your heart pound wildly. Because this is what priesthood is. 
You're offering your body as a living sacrifice. I can remember reading, I mean, I had read that, I don't know, hundreds of times. And about two years ago, it suddenly struck me. A living sacrifice? I mean, there's, in, the, in the Bible, there's no such thing. All the, all the sacrifices in the Old Testament were dead. That's what made it a sacrifice. Is <laughs> you sacrifice and you killed it. And then you offered it to God. Do you see how brilliant St. Paul is? He's so liturgical. Remember, he was a rabbi. A brilliant rabbi. So he understands, right? Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. He understands what now is the offering to God is no longer bulls and goats. It's the body. It's why Jesus Christ needed a body. It's why you need a body. So you can offer it back to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is an act of worship. This is my body given up for you. It's the act of worship, again, par excellence. It's the supreme act of worship, offering the body. Here's the way I would say it. The language of the body becomes the language of the liturgy in the marital embrace when the spouses offer themselves and the body of each other back to God in total, there we are, gift. Right, we're back to that word. They offer not only their own body, but the body of their spouse back to God in total offering. But look, you can apply this to priesthood, can't you? Right, when you are... Um, when you are saying the words of consecration and you're offering the body to Christ up to the Father and also to the bride, who else should you be offering up to the Father? Yourself, Yourself and Everyone. your bride. Right? You should be offering her that spousal offering that becomes liturgical. So this is, uh, I want to look at what I like to call the offertory rhythm. Did you have a question? I have a question just about the, um, so you're saying that the, the marital act itself wouldn't be fully liturgical, but that it also demands that the spouses live out that in their life. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because remember, the marital embrace, the marital act is an expression of the rest of their life. Right. So it's a mistake to compartmentalize it, again, this is part of what we do. So, so often people think they have to improve their sex life. Actually, probably what they need to do is improve their communion of persons. And improve their communion of persons, and guess what? Right? It will express and bear fruit in their intimate life. So I want to look at what I call the offertory rhythm. Again, I think many lay people don't really reflect much about what happens in the offertory. Why are the gifts of bread and wine brought from the congregation up to the altar? Why don't we just take them off a table and put them on the altar? What's the symbolism? You're offering yourself. That's right. Every person in the congregation is meant to join themselves to the bread and wine. To be united to the bread of wine and offer it up to the Father. So, but listen to even the way that we describe it. We offer to God what He's already given us, the fruit of the earth, right? The bread and the wine, but we don't give Him in its original form. We don't just take up grain and grape. So we have taken the fruit of the earth and we've transformed it. We've put our effort, our work into it. And we've transformed it into bread and wine. And so it's a way of symbolizing that we offer back to God what is both human and material. So if we disconnect ourselves from the offertory, we're not entering into the fullness of the liturgy. So we have to see that bread and wine as a symbol of us, of all of our work, and unite ourselves to it so it's taken up to the altar. It's brought up to the altar, and then through the prayers of consecration, we implore a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the bread and wine. So what do we call that? The epiclesis. So this is fascinating, right? We bring him the fruit of the earth, 
and the work of our human hands. We place it on the altar, and then we implore a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Why? So that the Holy Spirit will transform what's human and material, we could even say transubstantiate, right? Into the body and blood of Christ. But as I said before, no Holy Spirit, no transubstantiation. So critical moment in the liturgy. It's why I as a lay person find it so helpful when the bell is rung at that point. Because if by some chance I'm distracted, oh my gosh, I need to rivet myself back. Because we're, we're calling down the Holy Spirit on the bread and wine. So here's how we can say it. Through a new creative act of the Holy Spirit. It's not like, oh, I've already done this, you know, God. This is the Holy Spirit speaking. I've already done this five million times. Do I really need to do this again? Yes! Because it's a new creative outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What does God do? He, inf- he infuses the physical with his divinity. Infuses it, saturates it with his divinity. His real presence, and then the priest consumes it, and everybody goes home. No, I love it. Your body language, Brother Athanasius, he's like, that's not the way I see it. (laughs) You're absolutely right. This is why it's so important to see this offertory rhythm. We bring fruit of the earth, work of human hands, place it on the altar. We implore a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We believe by faith the Holy Spirit comes down, transforms it into the body and blood of Christ, and then God offers the gifts that we've already offered him, the first fruits, we offer it back to him. He, uh, he, uh, he transforms it and offers it back to us so that we can receive it. This is amazing. Can you see this divine human dance? It's so different than thinking God, God just comes down, you know, with his all-powerful will and does whatever he wants and ignores us. Do you see how he invites us into this rhythm? So here's what we can say. We receive God's gifts back in a transformed and divinized manner for our own transformation and divinization for God's glory. Who remembers? What's the working definition of glory? Excellent, Lorenzo. So visible manifestation of God's presence. So he transforms them. He offers them back to us. We have the privilege of receiving them, bringing them into our bodies so that we are transformed and divinized so that God can be visibly manifested. That's the offertory rhythm. I would propose that we can see the same offertory rhythm in the sacramental marital embrace. Because what happens? The husband pours himself out, right, in a total gift to his wife. Wife pours herself out in a total gift of herself to her husband. So they give themselves totally to each other. And in that totality of self-offering to each other, the husband can offer the body of his wife up to God. The wife can offer the body of her husband up to God. And because it's sacramental, it's sacramental matter, there's a way in which we have an epiclesis. There's a way in which the Holy Spirit comes down on the matter of the sacrament and makes the matter of that sacrament possible for divinizing, for communicating God's divine life and love to them. So they offer their bodies to each other, and in that offering to each other, they offer their bodies up to God, and God sends his Holy Spirit back down upon them, and transforms the matter, the human matter, doesn't transubstantiate it, right? Transforms it so that it can be a channel of grace, a communication, and they receive back from God divine life and love. Is that amazing? And I like to say, when husband and wife are married, so before they're married, okay, we've got John and Mary. I better use a different word than Mary. We've got John and Susan. Before they get married, John is John. John is Susan. 
But after they get married, right, God unites them in a supernatural conjugal bond. And now John is no longer just John. He's John what? Susan. And Susan is no longer just Susan. She's what? Susan? John. Right? This is what I like. He's now, this is, he's now a we person. His identity has changed. Susan John is now a we person. Like this, this is something new happens in marriage. It's a new identity. So John and Susan, they now become a we person at the moment when they say their vows and then consummate their marriage. And here's what I like to say. If God so desires, when they enter into the marital embrace and they offer the total gift of self to each other, they offer it up to God. God pours out the Holy Spirit upon them and offers His divine life and love back to them. They can now not only be a we person, but from that wonderful gift of love, we can have a... A we person. Right? A small person can emerge, right? The overflow of the love between husband and wife that mediates the overflow of the love between the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. So they communicate not only human life and love to each other, but divine life and love to each other that actually can become enfleshed in a we person. This is the gift of the sacrament of marriage as a capital S sacrament and understanding in some sense conjugal life becomes liturgical because they're offering the bodies of each other as a total offering a total sacrifice to each other and to God and God can do marvelous things with that yes that change in how a priest acts in persona Christi? You know, it's a great question, meaning, what are you thinking? Because I think I know what you're thinking, but tell me a little bit more. Well, like, this is by virtue of their marriage that they're mm-hmm. capable of doing so. Yes. And then the priest, by virtue of yes. the is capable. Is capable. Of in persona, right, is acting in persona Christi. They don't, yeah, they don't act in the person of each other. They don't act in the person of the, each other. But... Because of this, right? Because of the supernatural conjugal bond. So I was almost going to say this. I had paused and I thought, no, I won't say it. But now I'll say it. John Paul II says that there is a quasi-ontological change in marriage. Because we believe that there's an ontological change in priesthood. That you're configured to Christ. But you you have to be careful when talking about marriage. Because you don't want to say, well, John becomes Susan. And Susan becomes John. So John Paul II is trying to indicate there's something that happens at the level of ontology. When, this is why marriage is indissoluble. Because something has happened at the level of ontology because God has united the two in the supernatural conjugal bond. So are you two or are you one? The answer is both. Because you've become a we person. We can also think of the Holy Spirit as the we person of the Trinity. This we person. Because he is the relationship between the Father and the Son. Right? He is person gift. His identity is intimately bonded to both father and son. It's fabulous. So does that answer your question? Yeah, so, yeah cuz priesthood you're ontologically changed right. forever. That's right. Marriage is only bound to this. World. That's right. It's only bound to this world. So. Mhm. Right? Because again, who will we be spousally united to in eternity? Christ glorified body, and because we're united Christ glorified body, we're smack in the middle of the inner life of the Trinity. I know, it's something to ponder. I know, you could see why John Paul II was pondering like the same thing. So these are the kind of parallels you want to look for. All right, so here's a prayer from the fourth Sunday of Advent from in English. May the Holy Spirit sanctify these gifts just as he filled with his power the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's in English. Okay, here's my very rough translation. 
of the same prayer in Spanish. May the Holy Spirit sanctify these gifts placed on your altar who made fruitful or fertile with his power the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. What's the difference in Spanish? What's, what's present in Spanish that's not present in English? Fruitful. Yes! Do you see how important the fresh outpouring of the power of the Holy Spirit is fruitful? It's fertile. It communicates divine life and love. So I think, you know, we're, we're missing that super important concept that when the Holy Spirit is poured out, it's not just power, it's fruitful. It's fertile. So here's, we could say, is the summary of the liturgical rhythm for everyday life. We receive everything from God, and then we offer ourselves, our lives, our marriages, relationships, work, ministry, studies, right, spirituality here, even our bodies. And if one is married, the body of our spouse in the marital embrace, where do we offer it? Up to God. And we beg for a fresh pouring of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you, beg for a fresh pouring of the Holy Spirit. This is what Vatican II was about. John the 23rd, we need to open the doors, the windows of the church to a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. A new epiclesis upon our offering so that every element of our lives can be infused and saturated with the divine. In other words, it can be divinized. Everything. All creation is meant, all matter, all matter, I think I could say this, is meant to receive God into it. That's what it means to be a new heavens and a new earth. That means all matter is bridal. Because what does it mean to be bride? To receive the gift of the bridegroom. So do you see how our theology can even impact our metaphysics? The way we understand creation. Yes, Raphael. In as much as it's created, is that spousal as well? Like... I think just relating it to the <laughs> Eve mm-hmm. taken from the rib of the mm-hmm. creation taken from God. Mm-hmm. What would you say? I, I mean, I think we could say, that in a way. Stretching the analogy. Yeah, that's right. John Paul II loves this phrase, in a way. <laughs> I think we could say, in a way. Yes, all, all created matter is spousal. Because it's created to receive God into it. This is what it means to speak of the sacramentality of creation with a small s. It doesn't mean all of, cre- all of creation, all of matter is capital S sacrament. Meaning that when we encounter it, God guarantees that he will communicate his divine life and love to us. That's what distinguishes small S sacrament from capital S sacrament. Remember, small S sacrament is a sacred sign or symbol. But capital S sacrament. That's why placing the marital embrace is one of the sacramental signs of marriage is it's a game changer is what it is. Because it makes you realize how much God wants to work through the created world, not apart from it. So does that answer your question, Raphael? Like, in a sense? Yeah. This is why what's meant to be redeemed? Everything. It's glorified creation. It's, and it's glorified humanity. It's divinized humanity and glorified creation. So every element of our lives can be infused with the divine, can be divinized, which is the penetration. So we're back to audience 67. The penetration and permeation of what is essentially human by what is essentially divine, including the marital embrace. And everything can be made fruitful, can be made life-giving. Again, this is what it means to live a virginal fruitfulness. The more I'm united to God, again, John 15, the more I abide in Christ and Christ abides in me as Christ abides in the Father. That's marital language. Abiding, remaining, that's spousal language. Okay, I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds because it might be a little difficult to know why that um, spousal language. It's because in the act of marital embrace, the husband and wife, after they have experienced what we call a climax, there's a way in which the man literally remains in the woman's body and is at rest. He abides in her. She abides 
in him. It's, it's profound. Why is this important? A man and a man can never abide in each other. Ever. A woman and woman can never abide in each other. Ever. This is a very significant aspect of the one flesh union. And so again, I think St. John is calling on that marital imagery, that spousal imagery, to say, this is the way we ought to be in relationship with Christ. Christ abiding in me. I'm abiding in Christ. And from that, oh, the virginal fruitfulness flows. And who gets all the glory? Woohoo! God. So does being a Christian mean we try to minimize the connection between what's material and what's spiritual? Or do we try to strengthen the bond between what's material and what's spiritual? What is it? Strengthen. Of course. The goal is to strengthen the bond. It's to strengthen our sacramentality. I forget which book of C.S. Lewis it is, but there's a man who dies and you know, goes into eternity, and he's walking on the grass, and it hurts. What is it? The great divorce? It hurts because it's so real. Your glorified body will be even more real than your temporal body. Because it's perfectly spiritualized. It's matter and spirit perfectly united together, divinized. I mean, this is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's why all those images of those ethereal bodies, get rid of them. It's very hard. If you're an artist, please, would you paint for me and the rest of the world, you know, a painting, the glorified body with Christ's glorified body? We need new images. So the body reveals God. You cannot see it well. But in the background is an incredible image of the returning Christ. And like, he, you know, he's all man. We need images like that. We have these very, very wimpy images of the glorified body. Art makes a difference. Images form, again, the way we think. So the goal is to strengthen the bond between the material and the spiritual, between the human and divine. This is what liturgy does. You can't have liturgy without matter. It doesn't work. It strengthens it. This is what being rooted in the gift does. That's the whole title of this workshop. Rooted in the gift of trini robust Trinitarian anthropology. This is what a sacramental worldview does. Is we realize that God's intention is to communicate himself to us through all of matter. And finally, this is what the marital embrace does. It's meant to do this when entered into as a sacramental sign of the covenant of marriage. So here's a final quote for this panel. Through marriage as a sacrament of the church, men and women are explicitly called to bear witness by correctly using the language of the body to spousal and procreative love, a testimony worthy of true prophets. And that's exactly what he wants to develop in our very last panel. Uh, before I look, we look at the keyword, I just want to make a comment, which is that I am very privileged to be the fruit of marriage encounter. My parents, um, when I was young, went on a marriage encounter. And then I only re found out recently, my dad told me, well, I must not have got gotten it the first time around because we had to go a second time. <laughs> but I'm so grateful because I grew up watching my parents holding hands, watching them walk up to communion hand in hand, watching them. So marriage encounter teaches you a very specific skill called dialogue. And my parents would go into their bedroom and shut the door, tell all of us they were dialoguing, and we knew, don't bother them. I watched them do that year after year. It was so impressive. And my own spiritual renewal, my own encounter with Christ came through something called Youth Encounter, which was an outreach of Marriage Encounter. So I would not be who I am without Marriage Encounter so I want to encourage you. I re really think that marriage encounter needs to be renewed in a culture that is just decimating marriage. And here's what a lot of people don't realize is that on the marriage encounter team, there's always a priest. So I want to encourage you. Consider. If God gives you the gift of priesthood, consider becoming involved in marriage encounter. Because again, it shows the wonderful unity between priesthood 
and marriage. And man, if you've been steeping in theology of the body for three, four, five, six, seven years, man, those married couples aren't going to know what hit them. So please consider, you know, whether God might be offering you that as part of your mission as a priest and any chance you get to support it or encourage it to happen, please do. So we have one final element. What is it? Keyword. Right, so if you uh, turn back to the inside of your cover, did you write down there the keyword for panel five? Right, okay, so what was the keyword for, oh, we're on panel five, right? I'm sorry, panel four. Did you write down the keyword for panel four on the inside cover? Right, so again, okay, what could be the keyword for uh, panel five? What? Liturgy of, Liturgy of the body. That would be outstanding. What else could it be? Prophetism. Prophetism. Offering. Hmm? Offering. Offering. You know what, Joseph? We're going to go with yours. I really like liturgy of the body. Uh, in the past, I've used either um, sacramental. Sign, right? That because the body is the, the it enters into the sacramental sign, but I really think liturgy of the body captures it much better because it captures the idea of sacramental sign that the body enters into the matter of it. So thank you so much. Uh, so uh, liturgy of the body, right? Excellent. All right, let's stand up and take a quick stretch break, and then we're going to just move. Um, yeah, we're going to move into panel six.